So I want to start off with um, your book, a Mindset for Mastery. Uh, along with the talks you give, they cover topics around financial literacy, literacy and leadership. How did you decide to tackle these topics, and, and how did your life experiences equip you to focus on these uh, topics? Yeah, well, uh, thanks for having me here, and thanks to Dan and the team at Google for bringing me in. Uh, mindset for me really came into play when I was in football, right? There are countless times where I was unable, unwilling, and I thought that was it. And the truth is, is people lie to us throughout life, right? Uh, my first time I ever got my football pads, I got laughed off the field because I didn't know how to hit, and I was this big dude, you know? Next practice, some cornerback comes running down with the football, closed my eyes and leapt with everything I had. Turns out I knew how to hit, right? In college, I got literally knocked out of my shoes. That happened on your worst day in Google. Did you get knocked literally out of your shoe? And that sounds not pretty either, let me tell you, right? So I had to make up my mind right then. Hey, I am here at Notre Dame because I can play football. I will learn how to practice. I will beat this guy on one specific drill. I will focus on it. I will visualize it and then the next time it happened. And then I had to, after I got originally drafted to Denver, and I got fired. I had a new coach after my fourth season, and I was unwilling to work, unwilling to learn. What happens to those kinds of people? Get fired, right? I've never been more humiliated in my life. So uh, in, with tears coming down my eyes, you know, I'm thinking, how do I tell my wife in our first year of marriage that I lost my job because I'm unwilling? How do I make sure I never lose my job again because of my arrogance, and I had to choose my mindset. Say, hey, I can make sure I never lose my job again because of my unwillingness to work. I can stop at Panda Express on the way home, get that orange chicken, eat my feelings, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and sure enough, the next morning, Houston Texans called me, Gary Kubiak was the coach there, and brought me to the Houston Texans, which played well there for two years, played for the Kansas City Chiefs, and I talked about how people lie to you. After starting 15 games for the Kansas City Chiefs, and we just missed the playoffs. They said, you know, Ryan, we don't think you have any football left. Well, the Broncos called me back and said, hey, we think you'd help us win a championship. I said, hey, I can do that. And so I did. And so last Thursday, even though the Broncos lost, I had a fun time seeing my old coaches at the Chiefs. You know what I'm saying? Like, hey, good to see you. Uh, because we won the Super Bowl that very next year. So people lie to you throughout your life. And many of you experience that. Hey, you can't do this. You can't do that. Right? You, you aren't supposed to be here. And so with, between those experiences and having nine different surgeries in 10 years, three on my back alone, I had to choose my mindset every day. And especially when it comes to financial literacy. Ain't a lot of black guys walking in banks getting called Mr. Harris, right? And I want other people to have that moment in their life. And I've experienced so much benefit from small things that I've done financially that later helped me in ways I couldn't imagine. So what did financial literacy look um, like for you as you were growing up? Did you have any mentors that um, coached you in, in this space, and um, how did you grow into that? My first lesson in financial literacy I can remember is uh, everybody's gone to the grocery store with their parents, right? So I was young, and so I put a Snicker bar on the conveyor belt. My dad go, picks it up, says, what are you doing? I said, well, I want a Snicker bar. You know, we're here. He goes, do you have Snicker bar money? <laughs> no, but you do. He says, you're right. Puts it back. Grabs a Milky Way, his candy of choice. Puts it on the table. Like, what are you doing, man? We, uh, you know? He goes, well, I got Milky Way money. So right there, I kind of learned, like, hey, just because I'm with, you know, my parents, just because I'm around somebody who's capable, I've got to figure out a way for me to be financially successful. I need some Snicker bar money. You know what I'm saying? I need that right away. And fortunately for me, uh, I also learned from my parents what not to do with money. You know, from my family, we all, I always grew up thinking you were going to die in debt. That debt was a reality of life. And the better you can manage your debt, the better your life will be, right? And it wasn't until I left home and went to college and started seeing the way other people talked about money, didn't spend money, uh, really, really started to change the way I look at things and uh, sat down with a financial advisor or a woman who does, she teaches at University of St. Thomas and she took 30 minutes and told me, this is what a peg ratio is. This is what you do to invest in stocks. And I bought, took 500 bucks, uh, invested in Scott Trade. I bought, I'm not joking, McDonald's, Google, Apple, in this company called Chipotle, right? And I forgot about those stocks. And then a year later, I went back and that $500 turned into 1,300. I was like, whoa, okay. I like not doing anything for money. 
you know? And so I started learning the different ways that we can increase our savings. We can make choices about our money. And when you're in the NFL, you see a lot of bad choices uh, of what that people make with their money. I didn't want to be one of those people. So speaking of the NFL, about 80% of uh, players actually go broke in a couple years after retirement. Uh, why do you think that is? I think when we were chatting earlier, you mentioned that um, like Google's 401k is actually more generous than NFL's. Yeah. Um, but you don't see a lot of players actually maximizing the contributions uh, to the NFL's 401k uh, program. Uh, what do you think could be done? Or why do you think uh, this happens? And what could whether NFL or others do to improve that situation? I think all of us like to see our money, right? And when you have a lot of money and you're not used to, and you're not in an environment, somebody teaches you what to do with it, what choices you can make with it, uh, how to invest, you can see more of the money you make, right? And I think about one young guy that I, I, I mentored in the NFL. I said, hey, do not go buy a new car. Do not go buy a new car. Do not go buy a new car. And he goes out and buys a new, buys a new car. car. Porsche Panamera at that. You know, a car I'd still love to own to this day. You know what I mean? But I tried to tell him, hey, delay your purchases three months to three years. You know, we're getting into the holiday season. If you delay a, a purchase of a television for three months, you probably get 20% off. Right? Three years, somebody will give you that TV. You know what I mean? But sure enough, this young player who would make the first money of his life, 580 grand, which sounds like a lot, until you get taxes, so you're down to about 320. That car, now you're about 220, right? Not to mention, are you living somewhere, right? Are you going to eat? What are you doing for fun? So all of a sudden, three months later, this player with a Porsche Panamera gets fired, never works in the NFL again, is driving back to Philadelphia with a Porsche, no winter tires, no house, no 401k. Preventable, right? But how many times do we do that in our own lives? And we will make mistakes with money. Saving money is really hard to do. And knowing yourself and what you want to spend money on can really create your financial future to where you can achieve really the goals you set out to achieve by making small changes here and there. Did your teammates ask you for advice when it came to financial planning, amongst other things? Or what kind of resources exist for these players to um, ramp up on topics like this? You know, uh, not at first, because I was always the boring guy, right? Like, I didn't want to go out. Because you know what? If I go out and spend $1,000 at dinner and some other establishments you can spend money at, like, that's a lot of money. I ain't doing that. Y'all want to come over and watch Netflix? I got this $8.99 a month. You know, we've got <laughs> unlimited movies, right? Uh, but eventually, once I got, you know, because there's a big gap in the NFL. There's a lot of players who are in years one and two. And then there's a lot of players who are in years eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. And in between, there aren't a lot of them. So all of a sudden, when I'm a fifth year vet, people are like, hold on, Ryan. Like, you got a used car? You don't care what anybody thinks about you? I'm like, hell no. My job in the NFL is not to have a nice car. My job in the NFL is to whoop your ass if you're across from me, right? Let's not get it twisted. Let's not forget about what the, my car is to get me to practice on time. My car is to get me to the stadium on time. And so began to have those conversations. And I would sit down with guys. And I've done it in the radio station I'm at now. Sit down with people. Open up a Scott trade, a TD Ameritrade, an ING, or talk about their 401k. And tell them, hey, own what you buy. If you've got a, a Google phone, right, the Pixel 4, right? If you've got a yeah. Pixel 4 and you go to Starbucks and you like this company called Amazon that delivers things to your door, you should probably own those stocks. By the way, what's the, what's the telecom company that's on your, on your cell phone, right? AT&T, uh, DirecTV, what's, I mean, what is it? Comcast? Maybe you should own those stocks too. You ever heard of Walmart? Barnes and Noble? I mean, oh, I, mean I told you, I, I started with McDonald's. I was a fat kid, man. You want, what do I know and love? McDonald's, let's go, you know? <laughs> a great stock too. Parents, hey, my dad of three up there, you know what I'm saying? Hey, Disney, how, many, how much money is Disney taking from you? Own that stock, get a real cash back, you know what I'm saying? But these are things that are all around us, and it's amazing, not just in the NFL, but when speaking to people who look, young kids who look like me, multiple times, tears coming from players' eyes, tears coming from youth's eyes. I can own a stock, I can own part of Nike, I can be invested in what you all are doing here at Google on a daily basis, and you didn't, I don't even have to know you, like the empowerment that people get when they make the choices they really want to make with their money makes a huge difference. And I'm here for all of that. What does your investment philosophy look like? It sounds like you invest in stocks, but do you also do things like real estate? And do you have um, other types of investments that may be only available to high net worth uh, individuals? 
You know, it's, it's funny. Uh, every day in the NFL, the USA Today comes, right? Full of main page, sports. No one ever touches the money section, right? It's crazy. You've got literally 40 millionaires that don't read the money pages that are right there, that, like hand delivered, right? So the, my point in that is the information's out there. What do you want to actually do? You know, a lot of times we think, hey, I don't want to think about my money because if I make a mistake, then it's not my fault, right? Or our favorite thing to do, give it to somebody else. They'll care about it more than I do, right? Uh, wrong, right? But what I did is I learned. So I learned, hey, own what you buy. So I read Warren Buffett. You know, one of my favorite things he said is treat investing like baseball. If a stock's too high, that's not right. If it's too low, don't worry about it. Hit that pitch where you want to hit it. Real, sound, basic advice. I also had some great mentors who talked to me. And I was about to buy, I made the mistake asking a bank, what kind of house can I afford, right? Wrong question to ask the bank. They'll have you at 10% down and 8% you know, for 30 years. Well, I had a lawyer, Mike Doherty, who said, hey, Ryan, you sure seem happy in this two-bedroom apartment. I was about to buy a $750,000 house, single, no kids, one car. What am I doing, right? So just reading, asking questions. You know somebody who's good with money. You know somebody who doesn't waste money. You know somebody who doesn't come in and talk about what they spent last weekend. That's who you want to be around. Ask somebody who's retired. What do I need to think about? How many of you raised your hand have thought about how much money you're going to need every month when you retire? Wow, that's good. Because 90% of people don't do that. On top of that, 8%, although 8 more percent, do not actively invest to meet those means. Right? But what does it look like? Where are you living? So for me, I do stocks, yes, but I also like real estate. I do uh, commercial and residential, so I like duplexes, fourplexes. Players ask me all the time, what should I do with my money? I'm like, buy a duplex. Why? Well, I want to buy a house. You don't need a house. They're going to ship you out in two to three years. Well, I just got here. They drafted me. They like me. Yeah, and you'll be gone. <laughs> so when you leave, how about you make some money in that duplex in Denver or the Boulder area? I mean, how many of you, some of you do, how many of you would love to charge somebody rent and live maybe with one less bedroom in your house in Boulder? Right? So these are the kinds of things that are there. And so often we think it's unattainable, unreachable. I didn't come from money. I don't know about money. Well, those aren't excuses when you're talking about how you want to enjoy your life. And, whether, and money's not your enjoyment, but it's going to help. You know what I'm saying? It's going to help you get there. It's going to help you visit your grandchildren. It's going to help you when you find the person you want to marry and build a home. It's going to help you when you take your kids to Disney on ice and spend some money. You know what I'm saying? So these are all things that the information's out there. But so rarely are we willing to actively have conversations or take the time on ourselves to read about and learn about what we want to do. What do you think about the next generation of children and students and getting them engaged early in the world of financial literacy? Are there tactics or strategies that you have found to be effective in, in getting kids involved in this? Yeah, I, I give my kids the money talk every day. You know, we were just uh, in the store the other day. My daughter said, hey, Dad, can we get some hot chocolate? I said, you got hot chocolate money? <laughs> they don't even respond anymore, right? They just know. If I ask them that, they know that I know that they ain't got no money, right? How old are your kids? Uh, five, four, and six months. So, hey, I, I, don't, I do not care. <laughs> You're going to learn early, right? But especially with the digital wallets that are coming, when I mean, you think about it, our youth, they're not going to have a conceptual idea of money the way we do in terms of cash, right? I mean, they're going to be able to hit their phone six different places and have 12 different things arrive at their house. But actually showing them out. And one thing that's really awesome that I've done with people, with youth even as well, actually price out and calculate out the payment that you're making. Okay, you want that car. Instead of telling a, a young man that I mentor right now who's 18, he wants a $30,000 Chevy Camaro. Cool. How much is it going to cost? Five sixty-one a month. How much is the insurance? Insurance. Yeah, how much is the insurance? I don't know. Well, here's, here's an insurance number, why don't you call them? Okay, insurance is 150 a month. Cool, how much is gas? Gas, yeah, like you know, to make the car go. <laughs> oh, well, I best I drive 150 miles every week and it's 30, okay, so all of a sudden you need 150, so that car is now $800, $800 a month. Now multiply that out. Okay, now that's five times or two times as much as the car payment. Do you really want that car? No, I don't want that car, good. Now why don't you do it for a Prius? Right? A used Prius, a used Honda. Right? None of you know what car I drove to get here. And let me ask you this, does it matter? Right? No. 
But just making people do the math. I did that with a buddy of mine who wanted to buy a huge house. He could afford a $450,000 house. So I priced out the mortgage with him, and by the time he's end up paying, that's $850,000 for a $450,000 house. So they downsized. They cut some costs. So doing math with people, especially kids who aren't going to see the actual exchange of cash like we grew up seeing, it's important for them to understand the amount of money that insurance, that, that um, having equity, that having a different rate on your mortgage can really make and price it out. Price it out with people. So what kind of car did you come here in? <laughs> I bought a uh, GMC 1500 Sierra. Wide bench seats, you know what I'm saying? I got, yeah. got a little wide stance yeah. in the seats, Noble, you know? Uh, but I'll tell you what, I did it. Uh, my, not, my first new car I bought was in my ninth year of the NFL. And I did it at the end of Chevy Truck Month. So I went to Chevy, and I said, oh, I like that Chevy Silverado. And I went to GMC, and I said, I like that GMC Sierra. But Chevy's going to give me this deal. What can you do for me, right? Creating leverage. How many places can you create leverage in? So I got a screaming deal that would have been less than a used Tahoe on a brand new 1500 because nobody wants bent seats, I guess, anymore. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I don't need any uh, heated steering wheels. Hey, man, I'll turn the heat on earlier. You know what I'm saying? So I don't fall for the frills, but I got a nice vehicle and uh, it's comfortable. Talking about intersectionality of uh, financial health and uh, mental health, do you think there's correlation there? Like if, if you do well financially from a... Uh, knowledge perspective, does that carry over to the mental health? Thousand percent. I mean, they have studies that show when you don't have money, you're constantly in a scarcity mindset. And I don't know if any of you have been there. I mean, I was there in college, you know what I'm saying? Hey, we got 250 bucks a month, you know what I'm saying? I was 305 pounds. Try eating on 200 bucks a month, you know what I'm saying? You, you get some friends real quick. But, you know, it's, it's so rare that we talk about the connection between mental health and the confidence you have from the choices you make. How about, have you ever been upset with yourself for saving money? Anybody? You've been like, damn, I really shouldn't have saved that amount of money, right? Versus how many times have we been like, oh, we've got this extra surplus, so glad that I didn't spend it on the heated steering wheel, right? That I can actually go do something. I can go take care of my parents who are ill, or I can go visit my grandmother, or I can go to a funeral. I mean, these kinds of things make a huge difference. Not only that, how about, be, how about the leverage and respect that you can build with other people? Twice in my career, in, my, in the NFL, I told teams things that they had never heard. The year before I went to the, to the Broncos, they called me early and they said, hey, we want to do this kind of a deal. Hey, man, that's not going to work for me. I know my value. Each and every one of you in here knows your value as well. Well, they called back a couple weeks later. They gave me the best deal of my career. I was at the Pittsburgh Steelers after winning the Super Bowl, and they offered me a deal that was not to my standards. And because I didn't buy a brand new car, and because, how many cars can we drive at the same time, by the way? One, right? That's how many I bought. Because I didn't buy multiple homes, because I didn't you know, give money in, in large amounts away, I was able to say to the Steelers, I'll go home. And the look on their face of like, what? You know? You'll go. They said, give us five minutes. Came back, exactly the deal I wanted. Right? And later on, they told me, we've never heard a player say, I'll go home. How much more money could you have gotten in your contract right now if you have been financially secure, prepared for that moment, prepared for negotiations and said, this is my line. You want me here? Great. I want to be here too. This is what it's going to take. And what a lot of people don't know about the NFL is that they are invested in players being broke. Because Noble, if I'm willing to pay you $3 million, but you're broke because I didn't tell you you can only drive one car at one time, right? I didn't tell you about heating steering wheels are an option that you don't have to have, right? I didn't tell you could buy a used car. Well, now I'm going to offer you $60,000 and $800,000 salary. You may or may not have children. You may or may not have p debt that you need to pay. Do you take that deal? Your yes. body's already saying yes. <laughs> He's like, I'm broke. Yeah, I need the deal. Yeah. Well, well, I just go, now I go to the golf course and laugh at my buddies because I just saved $2 million. All because, Noble, you weren't financially prepared for the moment. And that happens all the time in every industry, in every sector around the globe. And you have tremendous power in the choices you make with the money you earn. And when you believe in that, and when you, and when you live life like that, you have time to go to yoga. You have time to see a mental health specialist. You have time to take time off and go on a vacation that changes you. You have time to take a staycation, staying at home. All these things come from the small choices we make with our money every day. 
and it can make a huge difference in our lives and the lives of the ones we love. You've been successful both uh, on and off the field. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the mindset you kind of talked about a bit earlier, but what are a couple things that you do to sort of train your mind to have the right mindset? Yeah, uh, I say the words, I am, I can, I will. Say it back to me, I am. I am. I can. I can. I, can. I, will. I will. Not like you believe in yourself. I am. I, am. I can. I can. I will. I will. I said this to myself the other day. I was at the pumpkin patch with three kids. I am <laughs> going to make it out of here. I can say it's time to go, and I will leave with one of these child at the pumpkin patch if I have to, right? <laughs> but it also helped me. You know, I talked about in college. I said, hey, I am here because I can be, right? I, and that helped me in the, in when I got fired. Hey, I am able to still be a good husband without being a Denver Bronco. I am capable of helping a team win a championship, right? So speaking I am gives you this moment of honesty with yourself. And when you speak the words I can, you can find the possibilities in front of you instead of the excuses or the happenings behind you, right? When you're down at your lowest, everybody's worked through a critical error in the software. Everybody's worked through a major problem. You're going to live beyond. So what do you need if you're going to be living beyond? How do you want it to look like? So I speak the words I can. What are the opportunities in front of me instead of what happened behind me? And then I will is just speaking that commitment, giving action behind it. I will, you know, I am bad at money. I can ask people who are good with money around me how to do it. I will follow them. I will read, you know, I will read articles. I'll listen to podcasts, things like that that can make a huge difference. So I chose my mindset with the words I am, I can, I will. But I'll tell you something else. Learn how to recognize distractions. We were going to the Super Bowl. And I got a call from a friend who I hadn't seen in five years. They said, hey, we want you to come by our kids' kindergarten class and get them ready for the Super Bowl. What? Hey, I love your kids. Love speaking to kids. Right now, I'm getting ready to leave for the biggest moment of my life, OK? I love you. We'll talk in the off season, right? It's not my job to get kindergarten kids excited for Super Bowl 50, right? I had 200 ticket requests for Super Bowl 50. How many of those same people were with me when I, after my third back surgery when I was out of the NFL and took the LSACs? I thought I was going to law school. How many people were with me in my toughest times? You think there were 200 people there? Were 200 people there for your moment? Right? Tell everybody back home you just got a million dollar bonus from Google and watch what happens. Right? My uncle, when I got drafted to the NFL, all of a sudden wanted to do a $1.5 million real estate deal. He's never done real estate in his life. Right? I was in, asked to invest in a company that sold the water, the, the milk from Fruit Loops, Frosted Flakes, Count Chocula, right? They didn't have a single licensing from General Mills or anybody with this, right? So there's all these things that are distractions. Who are distractions? What's a distraction? And I really learned that from playing with Peyton Manning because champions look and sound different in the NFL, right? There are 1,600 players in the NFL this year. Only 53 will call themselves champions. There are literally 1,500 people who are getting paid to lose in the NFL right now. And those guys will make you feel bad for staying in. Those guys will make you feel bad for studying longer. Come on out to the bar. Come on out to the club. Come on out to this. Bring your family. I ain't bringing my family. I got uncles still mad to me this day that I didn't bring them to the Super Bowl. That was $1,800 of tickets. I didn't bring my kids. Dude, them kids ain't going to remember that. You know? So all these distractions are around us every day. And we want to be nice to people. We don't want to change, right? We don't want people to say, oh, they've changed. Well, yeah, I changed because you stayed there. You didn't take risks. I did. You don't want to be great. I do. I'm going to sound different. I'm going to look different. And I'm going to work differently than you. And whether it shows this year or in nine years or in 20 years, I'm making that decision today. And that's how you choose your mindset everywhere you go. How do you feel like the NFL is treating mental illness? Has that changed in the course of while you were there and then maybe even now? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's tough for the NFL because there are multiple situations. There was one recently here in Boulder with a, a former teammate of mine um, where you cannot ignore the mental health aspects of playing in the NFL. They, there has been a change, though, significantly in terms of performance coaching, you know, mental health performance coaching. We had one the year we won the Super Bowl. And it was incredibly dynamic for me. You know, one of the things that I learned is the difference between external validation and internal validation, right? Do I want to be a captain and go to the Pro Bowl? Or do, I, or do I want to make that play that nobody knows that I worked on for two weeks? Do I want to be the difference maker in a play where a running back scores a touchdown and nobody knows my name? 
right? Or do I want people to say, wow, Ryan really made a great block. What's really important there? You know, I had a, I had a mental performance coach for ten, my, all my 10 years in the NFL. I didn't speak about it to anybody for nine years because the NFL wouldn't talk about that. What, you have, you, you get worried before a game? I used to think before every game, I would give up six sacks a game. My first start in the NFL was on Monday night in Oakland. And I thought, I woke up that morning, I thought, run, just run. Get back the money, you're gonna embarrass yourself, somebody's gonna get injured, they're gonna know you're a fraud. And this guy was up with my chiropractor, and I'm like, hey, what do you do? He's like, I actually work with the mental side for athletes. And I'm like, you need to help me right now. <laughs> and so he did. I'm like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this and do that. He's like, okay. And so we worked on you know, a concept called power tapping, right? Which is kind of separating the physical and mental kind of things going on between you. Meditation became a huge part of my life since my sixth year in the NFL. You know, what does your success look like? Visualizing that. And the night before the Super Bowl, I visualized what it was like. I had the goal to raise the trophy. And sure enough, 24 hours later, right? Because the night before, I could only see it from the bottom up. I thought, that's weird. For those who don't know football, it's a big metal football they put on the stand. And sure enough, the next night, we'd won the Super Bowl. And here's Peyton Manning handing me down the, the Lombardi trophy. And I'm seeing it from the bottom up. How, what does your success look like? How much time have you dedicated to seeing all your goals come true? And the NFL has gone a long way in allowing for that space for players to talk about, hey, you know, I do get nervous or I don't get nervous or here's how I handle it. A lot of, a lot of teams now, I mean, I've been doing yoga for 18 years for about 14 of them, you know, they called me names for it, right? But then the last four, they're like, hey man, can I join you at yoga? You know, Kansas City Chiefs have yoga every Tuesday. The Denver Broncos have a yoga expert that comes in. I mean, these are things that the NFL is starting to expand to. But I'll tell you, the NHL is far more advanced in that. There's an NHL player who won an award, and he said something amazing. You know, I may be mentally ill, but that does not mean I'm mentally weak. Here is a grown man, professional athlete, who could rip all our faces off, right, saying that he's got mental challenges. And being open about that has been the difference in a lot of lives in the NFL and beyond. I just want to ask you, what are some of the, uh, the main attributes that you've seen in successful organizations across like the NFL? You've been with four teams. Yeah. You know, what are some of the things that really stand out in your mind? You got to get together outside of work. And it's not just in the NFL, right? We'll do dinners on Thursdays. Uh, but I was uh, emceeing a panel with uh, a member of the U.S. national cycling team. And he said, there was one cyclist we had that was, you know, got a lot of attention and we couldn't have dinner. And the best team we were ever on, the only rule of that team was don't be late for dinner. And we had bus three the year we won the Super Bowl. And the only rule on bus three was no rookies. They asked too many questions, right? <laughs> Any rookie Googlers here? Any first year Googlers? Yeah? Yeah? You notice y'all kind of sitting away from people, right? <laughs> They're going to let you figure out the, the cafeteria by yourself, right? But you got you to gotta interact away from work. And that's something that's tough to do, whether you've got parents or or you don't want to go somewhere new, right? You may have the place you go for on Taco Tuesdays. But I encourage each of you to spend time with your teams outside of work. Top teams that I've spoken to have, will have their meetings even outside of the building. I mean, how many of your best ideas came when you were glued to your desk, right? Often it's walking around or in a conversation. Where can you go with your team? I mean, one of the things about NFL teams and the best part about winning the Super Bowl is week after week, there are fewer and fewer teams that are playing. But week after week, there are fewer and fewer teams having team dinners, right? Joking with each other. And you got to have fun. So I would say getting out together, but have fun, man. It is, I can only imagine working at Google how intense it is, right? But do you have fun every day? Do you laugh with your coworkers? Because you know what happens when you laugh? You build bonds that are impervious to failure. You build bonds that are impervious to misunderstandings. You have the confidence to go and talk to somebody, right? Because you were doing a ropes course with them and you were both terrified 10 feet off the ground that you were gonna die even though you had six ropes on you, right? You can say, hey, you know, maybe your intention was to do this, but let me tell you how that happened in my world. And, or hey, maybe next time you have an all, you know, a very important thing, you ask me if I'm doing anything very important because I was actually just, you know, talking to my family or X, Y, and Z. So it gives you all this confidence when you laugh with people. I mean, think about the people you laugh with. Do you ever, like, really not like being around them? You know? Like, there's always good things around people you can laugh with. And so have fun. Go to a ropes course. Do something you've never done. If you, if you haven't been to a roller skating rink and one of your team members loves to roller skate, go roller skating rink. You know what I'm saying? 
I mean, how many things have you really extended yourself for with your team? And you never lose when you win like that. Uh, as a college football player, did you have actually time to study? Too much. Too much time. You know, I, college was so hard, I'll never do it again. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I would wake up at um, 6 and sometimes be at a 7 a.m. workout, class at 8.30 uh, till 2. Practice meetings start at 2.30. Uh, practice would be from 4 to 7. And oh, by the way, dining hall closes at 7.30. And when you're 300 pounds and that dining hall closes, you're moving, right? So you eat from 7.30 to 8, and then I would study from 8 to 12. I did that for four years. And many of you have, too. And I will never do that again, you know what I'm saying? But what I loved is challenging myself to win in the classroom the same way I wanted to win on the field. And that's why I love Notre Dame. Because only at Notre Dame, and I, I encourage all of you to come join me anytime I do the radio broadcast there. I'd love to host you, put you on the sidelines with anyone you love, and, and give you the Notre Dame experience. But it's rare that people that you're around want to challenge themselves in more than one way. And it's rare that you have the opportunity to challenge yourself in more than one way. And so I loved that. And I'll never do it again, though. <laughs> yeah. Can you talk about that um, power tapping thing you were talking about? Yeah, so Robert Rulick, he's actually in San Francisco. Uh, shout out to Robert. It was really cool, too. I got to uh, bring him here for the AFC Championship game in my ninth year in the NFL to say thank you, you know, from that scared boy to now the soon-to-be, you know, Super Bowl going, woo, you know, having fun. But I got to bring him there. But so power tapping was just it's, you hit these different points that can separate, you know, anxiety or feelings because one of the things, like, if you think about the most stressful thing, I mean, even right now I'm like, uh, you know, so being a game, I'll be laying in bed like, oh my God, I don't want that to happen. I don't want that to happen. I don't want that to happen. You know, so when you tap and you create a physical sensation, it separates that mind body connection because your brain thinks it's real. You know, I mean, so the same way where then I would visualize success on the field the next day and it would often happen. Right? We talked about the raising the trophy and getting it, but you really I, I was searching for something to separate the mind body so that I could really dictate what I wanted to achieve and what I was capable of. You know, and so that's one technique that really worked for me. Visualization was huge. Dr. Rick Perea, who's here in Denver, was with the Denver Broncos when we were there. Uh, I talked to the president of the Chicago Cubs. They've got eight mental performance coaches on their staff, and like five of them are dedicated to pitchers, right? So, I mean, it's like <laughs> there's this idea that you, you have everything you need to be successful. And the reality is we have few of the tools we need to be successful. And the greatest one is willingness and, and ability to learn. And whether that's when you learn from being a first year at Google, right, to being a tenured professional here at Google, you had to learn some new things. And for me, and for a lot of players, and a lot of people, it's what can I do to make sure I'm not focusing on an outcome, but I have a process that makes me successful wherever I go. Because even after winning the Super Bowl, that's it, you know? When I got back to those kids that didn't come with me, you know, to my kids, I was like, they didn't care, I won the Super Bowl. But what's my process for finding achievement? Well, then now I've been able to do it in broadcasting. I'm so glad I didn't hinge my entire life on just winning a Super Bowl. For a long time, I'm sure for a lot of you, working at Google was a huge goal. And now that you've done it for three, five, six years, I'm sure you've found new heights that you want to reach to. So really trying to find those, those things. Meditation was huge. I mean, these are huge things that powerful and successful people use every day, you know? But we tell each other, oh, no, we don't need meditation. Oh, no, I don't need this. I don't need that. It's like, all right, man, cool. And you get a lot of that in the NFL. Guys with six chains. Man, I don't need to talk to nobody about confidence. Well, I'm swagged up, boy. <laughs> right, right? That's why you had to buy six chains, because five wasn't enough. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, so you, we got to have these conversations with each other. But really, it's a vulnerability for yourself of reaching out. Hey, what works? What doesn't work? You know, I had a teammate. We weren't going to win the Super Bowl, let alone go to the playoffs if he didn't play better. And instead of being like, hey, you got to get your crap together, it's like, hey, man, I've been using this guy for nine years. He's really made a difference in my life. I'd love for you to chat with him. He's ready to talk to you. He called him. The guy didn't have a problem the rest of the way. We are Super Bowl champions. So that's also as leaders, what kind of engagement are you having with others? It's not just about whether I found somebody, but just like the question you asked, what is that? What is power tapping? Who is that? What are some other tools you can use? You know, those are very important questions as a leader, engaging in that way can make a huge difference for your teams. 
sounds like you've been a great mentor for many people in your life. I'm curious, like early on, like who, who mentored you or what books influenced you and, and what would you recommend? Yeah, um, I got to give a special thanks to, to Michael and Mary Doherty. They, they really, you know, Michael Doherty specifically, I call him my conciliary. He's a business lawyer, right? But he gave me a lot of great advice uh, in terms of, especially with investing, you know, invest with somebody who doesn't need your money. Right? Like, why, if somebody needs your money, you're probably, they're probably going to take some of it at some point. I just recently was speaking with a company that's looking to digitize the loan process for infrastructure builders in second and third world countries. I said, hey, send me your, you know, PPM, your, you know, your private placement memorandum. Where, what are you going to do with this money? Oh, we're a tech startup. We don't really do that. Great. Well, you're going to use my money then. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, uh, but... So Mike and Mary Doherty were huge. My coaches were huge. I had a coach who was a gambling addict who talked about it openly, about how he almost lost his marriage um, and wife and kids because of his gambling addiction. Um, I had Daniel Graham was a great mentor to me in the NFL. He's a guy who, was, who went to CU, a big time buff, national cha world champion with the pa Patriots. And he didn't, he didn't know how much money he has, you know. Spending time with guys like Ryan Clady, who this guy's got a lot of money in the bank doesn't wear any chains, right? Seeing a Warren Buffett, how many chains does Warren Buffett have? <laughs> how about Bill Gates, you know? And also, in being a mentor, interjecting. After we won the Super Bowl, we had two rookies getting, I'm, I'm not lying, this is the hilarity of the NFL. Two rookies jump in the car on the way because we're going to Vegas, right, to hang out together and blow some steam. They've got brown paper bags. What the hell is in that bag? <laughs> cash, cash, okay, for what? Because they couldn't put cash in a backpack, right? It had to be in a brown paper bag, right? <laughs> I'm going to get some ice, man. Ice? What the hell are you talking about ice? You know, watch, chains. Okay. So I, I Google Bill Gates. Hit images. Boom. This is what Rich looks like. Bill Gates is wearing a purple polo and some New Balances. <laughs> How many chains does he have? None. Okay. That's one of the richest people in the world. Why do you need ice? And the look on one of the rookies, he starts sweating. He's moving his knees. He's like, can we stop back by my house? I'm like, yeah, we're going to stop back at your house. Put that bag away. You know what I mean? But, uh, but I was very fortunate to have mentors who didn't need my money. Mentors, uh, Ken Highfield, a guy here in Boulder who I wanted to get into real estate. And instead of saying, I want to get into real estate, I'm just going to throw my money at the wall. Who do I know in real estate? Well, I know this guy, Ken Highfield. Well, if I asked him, hey, tell me about real estate, I want to be rich. He'd be like, okay, no, right? Instead, say, hey, think about getting into real estate. Would love to join you at any meetings that you go to and, you know, just to learn and observe. So he invites me. So a couple weeks later, he says, hey, why don't you join me at this meeting? I'm going to the bank. Okay. So I go and I join him. First thing I notice, he waits to sit down until the guy across from him sits down. Cool. They didn't do that in the NFL. You know what I'm saying? You sit down or else you're getting fined. Right? So I sit down, and this guy's looking at me, and it's like, you know, what is this? Some kind of like, you know, mentor project or something, you know? And I'm listening and learning, and we leave. Well, I come back two months later with a deal that I like with that same banker, and I say, hey, man, uh, good to see you again. I was here with Ken, Ken Highfield. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this bank will give me this interest rate. What can you do? Wow, I'm so glad I asked and gave my time. So f whatever it is you want to do, be a quilter, be a motorcyclist, whatever it is, a gardener, who do you know in that space? Ask their advice. Ask if you can join them. Ask if you can learn the language. Right? All of you have had to learn a different language to be here at Google, whether it's programming or HR or even calling yourself Googlers. That's cool. You know what I mean? <laughs> but it's funny how we'll stop as soon as we leave work learning when your success depends so much on who you know in that space. And who doesn't like to get, give advice about something they're successful at? If I asked any one of you, hey, I'm thinking about getting a job at Google. Could we meet for coffee so I could learn what you think the best program for me to be in would be? I mean, there's like 20 of you nodding right now, like, yeah, yeah, check my schedule, you know? But we don't do that enough, and especially when it comes to finance, when it comes to being a parent, when it comes to these big things in life, I encourage all of you, reach out, find a mentor, or mentor someone else. Listen, if you save a kid from spending 50 grand on a watch that he'll never make that money back, how much better of a father, of a husband, of a son did you make that person? When we own things, we create real communities that see each other, right? 
And we have that opportunity as mentors, and we have that opportunity for the goals that we want to achieve to find mentors in that area to really create meaningful change. So I'm sure when you were in the NFL, you had a bunch of habits or pregame rituals to get you in the mindset that you yeah. need to be. How have you found uh, the ability to translate those habits now maybe into like broadcasting, TV, or being in a talk like this? Like, have you noticed that you use the same pregame routine, so to speak? Yeah. Um, how is that translated? And then for the folks in the room, uh, where maybe we did have pregame routines, so to speak, when we were doing something for a hobby or outside of work, but we find it harder re to recreate that time or space um, in the middle of a work day. How do you recommend that we find time or find ways to institute that into our day amidst meetings or other presentations? Yeah, there's a f I mean, that's a fantastic question. Uh, yes, I had routines, but I was also so grateful. My trainer a long time, Ted Johnson, had made me read a book, The Book of Five Rings. Anybody read that? Ancient samurai, all right, man, yeah, I got rich back there. Uh, because there's this concept in samurai warrior culture of no thing, not nothing, no thing. There's no thing outside of yourself that when you prepare yourself, in that case for battle, but when you prepare yourself for work, you're ready when you get there. So a lot of building a routine and finding a rhythm lets, it leads to letting go of things. I mean, I usually took fish oil and did, uh, I would do a hand-eye coordination little app. I still don't know if the app's real or, you know, some Russian bot just getting all my info. <laughs> but, I, but I would do that. Well, why? Because fish oil helps your brain and stamina and heart. Well, good thing when I'm going into a football game. And that hand-eye coordination has a tackle. No, well, I got to hit you in a certain spot, right? So I better practice that. Well, before the Super Bowl, somehow fish oil was out of my bag, right? And, some, and, and my iPad was uncharged. So I can go to coach and be like, coach, can't play. Don't have my fish oils. Don't got my iPad working. It's not going to work out today. You know what I'm saying? Like, I could do that, or I could just laugh and be like, damn, wish I had my fish oil, but let's go rock this anyways. You know? I also would prepare extremely hard. And that's something where, um, what's your name? Dan, right? Yeah. Dan, if I were to go against you, I would know everything about you when you're in the NFL. I would know that when you put your foot one way, that you're, doing, you're going left. That you put your foot one way, you're going right. I knew that on third down, you're going to try the spin move that you learned from Vaughn Miller because you thought he was cool and you can't do it yet, so I'm going to stab you in the chest when you think you can do it. Hug you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but now I go to broadcasting, it's like, okay, well, Notre Dame's going to play Michigan coming up. Well, what does Michigan do defensively? Well, they, they're a man coverage team. Well, who's blitzing? This guy's going to blitz. So I would take that same preparation and put it towards what I'm doing now. And what we failed to realize is how much power we have to prepare. We can control how prepared we are. We can control our reaction to an outcome. We can, we can throw a timeline and shorten it and raise it and extend it. We can do all of these things before anything actually happens. And so when I go into the broadcast booth now, I'm completely prepared, right? I may not use 90% of what I learned, but I might use it in something like this, right? I might talk about it in a different way. I may meet somebody who's a Michigan grad and say, wow, you really got a player there and, and Donathan Pe Peoples-Jones there at that wide receiver. Oh, yeah, you know, here you go. You're having a conversation. But we're, our preparation, preparation never goes unutilized. And that's something we learn in the NFL as champions. Whether you use it this week, next week, 10 years down the line, you know, we learned a drill, I learned a, a technique two years earlier, and we had a fourth down play but to go to the Super Bowl, to, to win a playoff game against the Pittsburgh Steelers. It was a fourth down play. The whole week, we're like, hey, if we don't get it on third down, we're going to do this play on fourth call. It's called Cobra, quick strike. You know what I'm saying? We're getting in there. Sure enough, third down, they stop us on the goal line, and Pittsburgh celebrates. Woo, we won the game. They look back, we're on the line of scrimmage, and the guy I'm going against, James Harrison, likes to fool tackles move inside out and kind of bait them. And it's like, okay, this is the play to go to the playoffs. I can just rock. If I hit him, I win. Or I can use my technique where I gather my feet so I can go north and south in case he moves. Well, thank God I remembered my technique and I shuffle because he spins back out. Wham, I hit him. Feel the running back, C.J. Anderson, hit me. I scored before he did. I knew him and I were looking at each other in the eyes before everybody said touchdown. Those little things, those preparations, something I learned two years earlier helped us win a playoff game. What information is around you right now that you can use that may help you today, but might help you in two years, might help you in five. It might be the difference in you achieving your goals or not. So that's why I use my preparation. Um, so when it comes to being prepared for a game, it seems like time management was really important for you. But on the back end of it, when you have to maintain like a sense of normalcy, what did you do to create balance in your life and also recovery? Recovery is huge. Number one uh, performance enhancer in sports is sleep. 
sleep. Sleep, sleep. So like when I was at the Pittsburgh Steelers, we started training camp. We had the doctor uh, who actually worked with the Golden State Warriors who helped them win their first championship talk to us about sleep. Oh, sleep can help your overall performance by 9%, cognitively 24%. You're literally coming in hungover if you don't sleep, right? But what does that mean? Maybe that means one less, epi one less episode of The Marvelous Miss Maisel, right? I love that show, it's funny. <laughs> but you know what, she gonna be there tomorrow, right? And maybe it's one less, you know, uh, happy hour, things like that. You know, so sleep is huge to recover. And then I, I was thankful, um, Mayor of Denver, Hancock, had a meeting with uh, me and some others, and, and I asked him, like, what do you do as a politician with all this, you know, you're constantly pulled? And one of the things they said is balance is not real, but if you want to ballast, right? Yeah, so I'm not looking for balance, but when I'm in broadcasting, when I'm, in, when I'm on the field, I'm on the field. And part of me misses that because short of somebody dying, nothing else mattered, right, when you went in on the field on Sunday. But there are going to be times where I'm not the best father because, or husband because I'm not home. But that means that I'm making money so we can go places like Florida for vacation or Vail or do some things. So for in, my, in my life, I've really let go of having balance. Like I'm going to be balanced with who I am, but I can't be a perfect father, a perfect husband, and a perfect professional every day. That's not a balance. That's unsustainable, right? But you know what? At times, family, cool. You got to chill. And at times, work, you really got to chill, right? So creating that, finding what that is. And for me and my family, it's vacations, and it's breakfast together, and it's dinner together. So I make an effort to be at those things, really focused on those things. That doesn't, I'm not going to make every parent-teacher conference. And I'm not upset that my mom missed or made any of the all parent-teacher conferences that she did or didn't go to, right? So what matters to you, your family, your situation, and create ballasts and know and have confidence that there's going to be times where that ship's swaying, but you're going to get where you're going. When I tell him that I was here and he wants to play and just, what is your advice for little ones? He's 11, he wants to play <sighs> yeah. football, and I'm a little scared to let him Me play. too. <laughs> uh, you know, the question is your kid loves football. Uh, I didn't play football until I was 14. And I was sitting next to a guy two years ago. He's like, my, my kids are the toughest kids, and we win the championship because we have the toughest training camp. I said, cool. Why do you have the toughest training camp? We hit the most. Cool. How old are your kids? Nine. You're an idiot. <laughs> right? Like, one of the things with, like, if I was going to go to a Google Academy that was a feeder to Google, and I was 11 years old, what, am I really learning from the best people? You know what I mean? Am I learning how to be a tech entrepreneur, to be a member of a team, to be a Googler? A lot of the coaches at these lower levels, you know, didn't play and are in their minds the John Maddens of the world, right? I mean, I'm sure you guys have met people in tech who are nowhere near where they need to be to be integrated into systems and protocols, but they really, you know, they've got their IT academy or something, right? That's what a lot of these guys are. And furthermore, you don't need to hit. You don't need to be physically aggressive. Because let me tell you something. When you really play the game of football, it's not about being aggressive. It's about dominating the person across from you. It's about completely taking their will to compete against you. Can an 11-year-old learn that? You know? Can a 12-year-old? So one of the things I look forward to hopefully doing here in Colorado, I would love Colorado to be the first state that doesn't allow contact football before the age of 14. Developmentally, there are issues. Just from a schematic standpoint, they are not going to learn what it takes to be successful in football because you can't. How could you possibly learn, you know, have a mentality to, to kill someone's will when you're 11? You know, you're still sharing teddy bears. You know what I'm saying? Like, things are different. So uh, I would encourage you, though, to use flag football. Take them to a game. Take them to a college game. If you live here in Boulder, I mean, take them to CU. It's probably, what, 15 bucks a ticket right now? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, but take them. But allow them to be on a team, and that's the biggest thing with sports, is let your kids have fun. You know, I had a teammate of mine in high school, Joe Maurer. He's probably going to be a Hall of Famer in baseball. And recently had him on my show because, you know what, we were teammates in football. Still, to this day, one of the best quarterbacks I ever saw. He also played basketball. And here he is about to go into the into Hall of Fame in baseball. And I said, Joe, parents these days, they want to wipe away and focus so early on sports. What would you have done? It's a Hall of Fame baseball player saying, I would have chosen basketball. 
One of the greatest baseball players to ever play would never have played if he was forced to choose a sport. For what? Right? To compete at 11? To compete at 13? No. Let their kids have choice, experiences. You know what's a great lesson? Being a bad player on the team in a sport that you suck at. <laughs> soccer? I was terrible at soccer. And I, thought, I fought every, game, every practice not to get lapped on the two laps before soccer. That's it. I just didn't want to get lapped. But it taught me how to be a good teammate. Was that more important, or should I have been playing football at nine? You know, and I've seen guys at Notre Dame in the NFL who, when they get there, they're done because they've been playing since they were six, nine, ten. If you've been a Googler since you were eleven, how much would you love being here? <laughs> right? People be like, "I'll Google it." You're like, "Please don't. Just use <laughs> something else." Right? <laughs> right? But that happens all the time with youth and athletics. You're going to have to yell really loud. For exercise and recreation now, how does it impact your life? Yeah, so I love uh, exercise. Um, if you ever seen them, watched, I think the book is called, um, I can't believe I'm forgetting the name of it right now, but it talks about how each and every day exercise changes and expands your brain. Even seven minutes of exercise per day can really change your brain. So this morning I went on a walk with my wife and kids. You know what I mean? Like, get out, be active. I do swimming. I do spinning, I do the yoga, I'm big on the yoga, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, and you know, the big thing too is, I tell people, cause they're like, hey, what should I do to stay in shape? I'm like, stop worrying about what other people think about you, you know? Cause I think, you know, running, sometimes people say, well, I don't wanna run cause I don't want people to laugh at me in their car. How many times have we laughed at somebody when we're riding in a car when they're running? Usually we're like, damn, I should probably get a run in too. <laughs> but like when we do these things, we have this idea, like especially even in yoga for me, I thought everyone was looking at me in yoga. I'm like, oh my God, I'm the only black person here, okay? Like sweating profusely, Every, no one's watching me, you know? So kind of getting over that, getting over that. But there's a good, uh, I think it's called Spark, the book. And it talks about how exercise is better than medication when it deals with depression and anxiety. You know, you meet new people, you place yourself in all these opportunities. So I try and be active every day, and, uh, and, and to, the, to the extent that my body allows. You know, I, I was about 10 years ago, my doctor told me I had a 90-year-old's back. And I was like, okay, I'm 28, you know what I'm saying, 24. Uh, but exercise is huge, I love it, and it makes a huge difference in my life. I encourage all of you to find something, rowing, walking, running, climbing, anything that gets you active, gets you out of your comfort zone, and literally expands your brain. Ryan, I want to thank you for uh, coming, joining us uh, this morning. Um, I think a lot of your insights were um, amazing. I'm looking forward to reading your book. Thank you. Um, you've been super down to earth, and um, thank you. Thank you, Noble. Thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate it.